<coughs> Respected chairperson, eminent panelists, ladies and gentlemen, very good evening. Um, I'm greatly privileged and deeply honored to be here to ask me to be presenting to you my views on Indian strategic culture. Um, and I have a great task on hand because I think I have about 15 minutes to convince and prove to you all that there exists an Indian strategic culture. And I'll be exploring the roots to do so. Not roots deep enough as Dr. Adil Rashid has done, but are uh, uh, still deep enough. Uh, the objectives, I've laid them out for you. Uh, the primary being uh, to essentially demystify Indian strategic thinking. There's a lot which has been said and written by both Indian and Western scholars on Indian strategic thinking, but there's nothing which I feel is conclusive, uh, testable, available for research. So uh, the effort here is to cut out the fog and reach out to the essence. I think some of the concerns which Professor Muni raised. And to do this, I employ a theory of strategic culture which is propounded by Alistair and Johnston. We've heard uh, two fleeting mention of him uh, in two very different presentations today. Um, the reason I choose Alistair and Johnston is because his conception of strategic culture is falsifiable, its development is empirically traceable, and most importantly, its effect on strategic choice is measurable. Um, what does this entail? It entails delineating the fundamental elements or the core beliefs of, uh, you know, which are reflected at a state's strategic preference level, and at the same time are rooted in a formative ideational legacy. Uh, the formative ideational legacy for the purpose of this study, I've carefully chosen to be Kautilya's Arthashastra. Before we go on to delineating the central paradigm, just a quick word on uh, what Johnston uh, thinks about these various themes. So uh, all these five points are the themes around which debates have essentially evolved in the entire decades of theorization of the theory of strategic culture. And this is how Johnston uh, approaches each of these themes. So he clearly defines strategic culture as a system of symbols comprised of two parts. One is at the basic level, it's a basic assumption level about the general orderliness in the environment. The second being at a more operational level, a grand strategic level. He's very clear about the sources that feed into strategic culture. They are strategic cultural objects found to be in the earliest point, possible point in history. Culture and behavior, it's probably uh, the most debated issue in the theory of strategic culture. He sees culture as an independent variable and behavior as a dependent variable and he seeks a causal linkage between the two. There's a broad consensus on keepers of strategic culture. They are the strategic elites of the highest institutions of decision making. So uh, basically, so theory of strategic culture has gone through three generations. When I say broad consensus, it's consensus in all the three generations. Uh, amenability to change, it's an important point. So Johnston does not do away with um, the objective conditions and the objective variables which are available, but he thinks strategic culture acts as the interpretive lens to those objective variables and gives meaning to that. So in that sense, it is, it can change, but changes very slowly, um, mostly lagging behind changes in the objective environment. Is it pitted against structural realism, the essential um, IR theory, the mainstream IR theory? Well, uh, the research started uh, on strategic culture um, seeking out strategic realism as the edifice of target. That's how it began, because uh, mainstream IR theories could not um, successfully explain developments in the international realm. Uh, to that extent, yes, but it's much more nuanced than that. I don't think I'll go into this, um, maybe uh, um, at a later point. So uh, uh, these are the methodological uh, issues which have been debated, and clearly uh, you can make out from uh, Johnston's approach, uh, it's a very positivist uh, agenda that he has. He definitely wants to you know, get a grip on strategic culture, something as elastic as that. Well, he follows a three-step research process, and um, that's one, two, and three. One A and one B is uh, within the purview of my study, my paper here. Uh, step two and three I'm taking up parallelly as part of my thesis work, which is a work in progress. Uh, one A essentially is to extrapolate from the object of analysis a central strategic paradigm. Now what is a central strategic paradigm? It's essentially answers to three key questions that he asks, which relate to one, nature of conflict in human affairs, the nature of the adversity, and the efficacy of the use of violence. So answers to these three questions, I'll come to those later, uh, supply, um, uh, you know, so these form the central strategic paradigm. So once you have these basic assumptions clear, you get on to a higher level, the grand strategic level, where you derive a ranked set of grand strategic preferences. 
that's one a and one b the second step then very logically is that if you you know from a text you've called out these uh, central strategic paradigms and grand strategic preference ranking then you ought to find the same preference ranking in a sample document uh, in a different strategic context in a different time period period of your study to show the congruence and the continuance of strategic culture so that's step 2 uh, step 3 um, essentially is to test the effects of this a uh, preference ranking on actual strategic behavior angles as he puts it the proof of the pudding is in its eating so it is a very critical last step why have i chosen uh, kautilya's arthashastra i don't think i should waste my time on this slide i think michelle libesh um, um, has uh, mentioned the key points um, just uh, so that we you know get a sense of uh, what johnston is looking at when he's uh, thinking of strategic cultural objects as the analysis he's very clear about the text being you know at the earliest point in history available to the researcher and where strategic culture derived strategic preference ranking seem to have emerged so those are key theoretical uh, you know um, essentials that you need to look for in a doc in a text um there are three others which he mentions i'll just briefly go over them one that the text should not lie outside the broader strategic and philosophical framework which i think we all agree it does not uh Uh, the next that uh, you know it should provide a textual and intellectual uh, basis for much of the writings to follow we know how uh, kamanda and vishaka datta and kalidas have all uh, you know shown um, um, uh, contact with um, arthashastra there uh, and last which i think is very important is that the text should deal with grand strategic questions it should not just talk about military tactics or tactics in the battlefield and in my assessment i think um, arthashastra is a magnum opus on grand strategy we'll come to that in a later slide uh now i'm going to take up 1a which is essentially answers to three questions i've called them out from the text don't have much knowledge of the text but whatever i've read of it i think these uh, findings are representative of uh, some of the findings i've got from the text i couldn't put all of it together it's part of the paper that i've put in um what is the role of war so very clearly johnston asks uh what do you think the text says is war an aberrant is it something that you don't wish to do or is it a recurrent theme according to kautilya's arthashastra um the fact that yogashema is convincingly uh, linked to matsinyay so there's an anarchy out there and it's the raj dharma of the ruler to bring about order um, by chastising the aggressor so in that sense war becomes inevitable uh, several mention of all kinds of warfare you know prakash yudh kuti yudh tusnim yudh righteous warfare demonical warfare when you should go to war when you shouldn't go to war so all this suggests the conclusion that as per kautilya war is definitely not an inevitable phenomena sorry it is an inevitable phenomenon uh the second question is what is the nature of adversity so how does cotelia view adversity is it like a zero sum game where my gain is your loss or is it a variable sum game cotelia lays down a whole gradation of relationships starting from natural enemy to hostile neighbor to friendly neighbor to vassal states in fact the entire mandala theory uh, has these various constituents which have a very dynamic relationship with each other which keep, which keep shifting because of you know changing political goals and ca resource capabilities because of which there really no permanent friends and no permanent enemies i think somebody said that <clears throat> uh this whole concept of relative power it's a very well discussed theme in the text so uh Uh, a state's position is determined by its relative decline and progress vis-a-vis other states uh lastly there is an enemy but the, it's the enemy's disposition really which determines the level of threat um so the broad conclusion is that sometimes relationships do tend towards a zero sum game the third question part of the central strategic paradigm is what is the efficacy of violence does cotelia think that uh violence uh, is capable of controlling outcomes or not uh clearly he was a political realist he bought this entire empire together so he knew the utility of the use of force but uh, again very clearly from his text war is to be used as a last resort as uh, my colleague mentioned um the fact that you know mantriyod uh, upajapa psychological warfare all kinds of warfare which really don't essentially make use of violence and yet their forms of warfare suggests that really war is to be used as a last resort now interestingly in johnston's uh, balance this extreme ideal form so he suggests that you know if war is a permanent phenomena and relations tend uh, towards zero sum then the obvious logical third corollary would be to use the superior uh, use superior force uh interestingly cotilla does not think so so he thinks that if war is an in a recurrent phenomena and relations tend towards zero sum 
war is still to be used as a last resort. So it's an interesting uh, departure. Now, uh, these are the basic assumptions about the ordinates of the environment. Uh, we get to a grand strategic level. And before that, I thought I'll just mention to you how the concept of grand strategy is used by Johnston and how um, I have used it for my study to cull things out from Kautilya's Arthashastra. Um, I define grand strategy as the combination of national resources and capabilities, military, diplomatic, political, economic, cultural, and moral that are deployed in the service of national security. So clearly, there are three operable areas here. So there's a um, political goal defined as national security. Um, at the base, there are these resources and capabilities, prakritis, if you wish. And then there's, between these two uh, poles, there is this uh, foreign policy action, you know, which feeds back and forth. So based on the resources and capabilities, it decides on the policy action to achieve a national goal. And all these three levels are very well dealt with in the text uh, by the names of Yogashema, Prakritis in the Saptang theory, and the Shadgunyas in the foreign policy action. Now, it's all good to have a grand strategy, but how do you make it testable? So you have to devise a typology whereby you can categorize all kinds of grand strategies which are thrown up. So Johnston helps us here. He uh, takes two criteria to categorize grand strategy, uh, one being exclusivity, that each of these cat categories should be mutually exclusive from each other, and two, that it should be exhaustive, that all the possible politico uh, political military behavior that you can think of should come into one of these categories. And based on these, uh, this criteria, he um, puts forth three categories of grand strategy, accommodationist, defensive, and offensive. Um, accommodationist, as the name suggests, refers to low coercion policies, diplomacy, economic incentives, alliance building, etc. Defensive is slightly more coercive than the former, deterrence by denial, uh, bordering, um, maintaining uh, security on the external boundary, etc. And offensive is a highly coercive where uh, punitive military uh, use of force is done and uh, destruction of the enemy is the key result. Interestingly, all the policies mentioned under the Shadgunya collapse well into these three categories, thereby affirming that the choice of the text is good. Um, now, based on this typology, this is 1B. So we've got 1A, this is 1B. We're trying to now find out what is the grand strategic preference ranking as per the text. Uh, in my assessment, it's accommodation is first, defensive second, and offensive third. And why I say this, I mentioned them here. Accommodation is first um, for a very simple reason that, you know, if there is a overlap between Shadgunya and Upayas, and Upayas we know are definitely ordered, Sam, Dam, Bhed, Dand, and um, as Kangli says that, you know, there's a correlation between Samdi and Saman and Vigra and um, Dand, then the order is clear there. Also, um, two of the foreign policy actions, Samdi and Samasri, fall under this category. And uh, the fact that Mantra Shakti is favored over Utsar Shakti, Prabhav Shakti, also, Kautilya mentions a lot of advantages about following uh, an accommodationist policy, which are to enjoy the fruits of acquisition, um, wait for a favorable opportunity to act, et cetera, et cetera. Defensive. Uh, Yana, which is marching, which is a form of coercive diplomacy, falls under this category. And uh, the fact that Durg, which is fought, is mentioned earlier than Dand army, um, clearly shows the uh, preference ranking there. Um, also, uh, there's a great amount of emphasis on uh, preparing your troops vis-a-vis -vis the troops of the adversary. So it's always like infantry fight fighting, infantry cavalry fighting, cavalry. So there's a deterrence, defensive kind of an uh, approach uh, there which is visible. Offensive, um, in my reckoning, seen as a last resort. Vigre war falls under this category. Uh, two policies, Devedibhav, which is dual policy, and Asa neutrality do not neatly fit into these categories, but Johnston um, suggests that there is a possibility of you know, uh, overlapping of categories, so that's fine. Um, so interestingly, um, uh, so, uh, so Johnston suggests that you know, 1B should be a logically flowing thing from 1A, which in this case it is, because if war is seen as the last resort, offensive ought to be the last and third um, uh, preference ranking. So not only do these um, um, 1A and 1B are coherent with each other, these together form uh, what can be called Indian strategic culture as coming out from Kautilya's Arthashastra. Broad conclusions, there exists an Indian strategic culture which is deeply rooted, consistent set of assumptions about the strategic environment and the best means of dealing with it. 
Interestingly, the process of arriving at a grand strategy in Kautilya is very similar to that of structural realism, which is, uh, you know, calculation of expected utility of different strategies uh, based on available resources and capabilities. That's if, in effect what Kautilya is also doing. So how is Kautilya different? One, that Kautilya views that the objective uh, variables are viewed through a very normative dimension, which is welfare of the people. So that's the USP there. Uh, the second, which I think is very important, is that this entire scientific method of, you know, inquiry into the objective conditions is itself an inalienable part of the culture. It's not something which is there which you may or may not take into reckoning. It's the entire culture talks about the objective environments, the health of the prakritis, before you arrive at a strategic uh, decision. So there's an element of dynamism there because if you're relying on uh, something which is variable, uh, uh, there has to be a dynamism. And the third, that there's a set of core philosophical and ethical principles which kind of constrain the effects these objective conditions have on national security policy making. And in that sense, this set of core principles is less liable to change. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to use the term realism plus to uh, define what we have here as Indian strategic culture. It's a term used by a former NSA, Shiv Shankar Menon. It essentially means the Indian realist tradition. And I think it fits, fits our case well here. So steps 1A and 1B have been covered in this study. Step 2 is to check for the congruence of reference ranking within Arthashastra and a text um, um, of the period of your study. I've taken up the draft nuclear doctrine to look for such strategic preference ranking in the text. Um, that is being done parallelly. It's not part of this paper. And step 3 um, is essentially to establish the effect of this uh, uh, strategic culture on strategic behavior, which will really highlight the essence of the analytic value of strategic culture as an independent ideational variable in decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much.